here we are! Camera's rolling, I presume! Yay! <laughs> we are here in Coromandel Town, New Zealand, at the home of Dr. Wendy Pond, and we are going to uh, talk and share some things with you. Welcome to show number 113. Everybody sing along from wherever you are. Something's gonna happen and it could be good. Something's gonna happen and it could be good. Something's gonna happen and it could be good. Something's gonna happen like we knew it would. Oh, things will change and leaves will fall and it will rain. Transform before your eyes with no time for chasing why. Why is that happening? Why, why, why? I don't know. Whoa, you never know just how life is going to go. So you jump in your boat and row, row, row. Jump in your boat and row, row, row. Here we go, all together now. Something's going to happen and it could be good. Something's going to happen and it could be good. Something's going to happen and it could be good. Something's going to happen like we knew. ahead and trust yourself because everything will right itself oh, life's a stream so go ahead and follow your dream jump in your boat and row 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 jump in your boat and row 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 here we go something's gonna happen and it could be good something's gonna happen and it could be good something's gonna happen and I would like to invite Dr. Wendy Pond to the stage. Here you are. Welcome. Thank you. We are so pleased to see you. Do we shake hands in New Zealand? I find that people don't shake hands too often. Uh, they used to, but the younger generation hug. Hug. I, I, I think a handshake's adequate for us. Okay. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Start with a... Uh, so... Um, you were born here in New Zealand. Yes. And do you mind sharing your age with uh, humanity? Well, I have just turned 80. And so this is a time when I'm reflecting on what happened in my life during 80 years. 80 years, you've learned a plenty. One thing, yesterday we uh, ran into each other because you were after some seaweed. So we'll start by talking about seaweed. Well, this is New Zealand kelp. It was washed up in last week's storm, torn off the rocks and thrown up in the surf onto Whangapua Beach. And a friend collected a trailer load of it. Here, generally kelp is used for people to put on their gardens. And I will certainly do that and make liquid manure. But I especially want to hang it up and dry it and then I'll very gently bake it in the oven till it's crisp and crunch it up and use it to sprinkle on my food. On your food. Now, can you bake it at too high a temperature? Oh yes, it must be a low temperature. A low temperature. Very gently, just to dry it and make it crisp. No and, more. And some people just lay this seaweed directly on the garden. Yes. And But you're making a compost tea with it. What? How do you make that? Well, um, here, muscle boys in the muscle industry. A muscle boy, uh, a, it's not a boy like a boy, it's a buoy, we, call, we say in America, so a flotation device. Yes. Yes, and they're, they're about the size of a 55-gallon barrel, but shaped more roundly. That's right. For those of you in the U.S. <laughs> yes. So we use the muscle boys for gardens, and uh, somebody's used them to make his storage system. And I used them with the tops cut off and stood up as barrels to hold liquid manure, which is made from water and dung and comfrey and seaweed and kelp especially is very good. And when the fishermen are cleaning their fish, I bring back fish frames and fish heads 
and put And how long in. does it have to all soak in the water? Well, the idea is to let the ingredients ferment. So after about two weeks, there should be a fermentation process. And then I start dipping it out and putting it in the soil. Yeah. And you can eat this seaweed right off the beach raw. Oh, you or have the kelp. Can you, you can just yes, eat it. Yes, yeah. kelp is edible. I, but I've just eaten a piece. It's hard and chewy. Yes. <laughs> but you do need to know which seaweeds are edible and which not. Yes. Well, that one, the golden kelp is edible. Yes. Yes. All right. Now, I know that you prepared some subjects that you would care to share with us. Thank you. Yes. Well, now we're talking about seaweed. I'll talk immediately about Coromandel as a transition town, which was declared to the council maybe a decade ago. Transition town, yes. as opposed to what other kind of town? Just a normal one. Well, it, it comes out of the present tide worldwide of the feeling of a need to be self-sufficient in our lives, that we cannot any longer go on depending on mass production, that we're using too many natural resources. And we need to make play a much bigger part in our lives with providing for our own needs. Hmm. So the transition town is currently being maintained through a community network. And our first objective has been to create our own personal self-reliance. And we've begun with classes in gardening and um, growing edible mushrooms has been very popular. And we've also started a series of workshops in first aid mm -hmm. so we can meet accident and emergency situations. And now those workshops have gone on to making our own medicines from New Zealand native plants. And other people are working on workshops on how we can have an alternative currency or at least an exchange of work hours. Yeah, we have that um, in, uh, in Florida where I'm from in a lot of places, we call it a time bank. And mm -hmm. I would come work for you for an hour. You would pay me an hour, yes. which I could then uh, spend on with somebody else, with the car mechanic or anybody else. I don't have to exchange it directly with you. Yes, The bank lets us change it all around. Yes, that is such an exciting um, way to go. Yeah, and, I really, and really. I suppose presently, one of our major concerns is how we relate to each other, um, that we need to learn to work cooperatively, and we learn to need to treat each other with respect and regard. And there's a certain amount of discussion about amongst us, are we going to set up standards or are we just going to let the situation evolve? And so far, we're just letting things evolve. And that has been very successful. There's um, extraordinary response in the community for people to help each other hmm. and to participate. We're setting up our own cinema, for instance. Oh, yes. Oh, how exciting. Yes. And there's a, yeah, where we are on this peninsula, there's been quite a bit of rain and there's slips, which is, we would call sort of a landslide, and you get cut off from the rest of the country. So it's good to have some local medicine and work and entertainment. Yes. Yeah, because yes. when the road goes plummeting into the ocean. <laughs> yes, as it did at as, the Kopu Hikawai Road. Yes. 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 So, the, so far things are working out very well with this surprising goodwill amongst people. To, um, to change our lives to being self-sufficient, cooperative, and really we would like much more local government in our own community mm. so that we can run our own show and move towards more decentralization, really. Self-sufficiency, decentralization. And have you always been such a radical <laughs> or radical idea? <laughs> well, yes, actually, in, in, indeed. I recently participated in the People's Inquiry into the Poisoning of New Zealand. Oh, dear. And yes. this, this was an inquiry motivated by five middle-aged women 
simply called for a national inquiry and they collected submissions from people all over the country um, concerned about the use of poisons, especially industrial poisons, herbicides in orchards, sprays along roads. And so we're moving towards, on Coromandel Peninsula, a landscape free of poisons. That's our objective. That's and our aim. I can, yeah, I can imagine that there are some people perfectly happy with the poisons and they don't... Yes, well, especially men. <laughs> yes, it is. It was some women who... <laughs> yes, it was five women who initiated this uh, inquiry. And I think... Um, there's been a tradition in the Public Works Department, which no longer exists, but the tradition is there to move away from handwork, like digging ditches with a spade, to technology. So we now have machines that go along the roadside, mm -hmm. eliminating all growth on the banks. And where we once had native ferns growing, now we've got weeds growing because the introduced weeds established much more quickly than the, the, the native plants. Yeah, and it's super interesting because here I was weeding in, uh, in my friend's garden yesterday and the weeds are the same weeds here in New Zealand as in Florida and Virginia. You've got your Queen Anne's Lace, your Plantain, your... Wild um, Carrot. Wild Carrot, yeah, all of those. Buttercup. Buttercup, yes. and. Um, uh, a, that little euphorbia one, you know, there's just all of the weeds. They're the same weeds. I don't know whether it's all over the world, but in England, I guess they all came from England. Yes, yes. And, and I was in Hawaii when ecologists were describing how the floor of the Hawaiian forests, the new regenerating seedlings are 50 or 80 percent introduced species. Yeah. So if people foresee the collapse of native forests, mm. which is very disheartening. Mm. But at least it has woken up an enormous effort of regenerating our landscape with native species. And do you feel like that, um, are you hopeful that more people are interested in that? Do you think that, that, that the idea of regenerating or using land, do you feel like people are more interested in native, non-poison, than they ever have been? Do you think we're moving forward? Well, the people are, the people in, especially the people in the rural communities, but our government isn't, our local council isn't, mm. it's our local council that contracts for the spraying of the roadsides. It's our Department of Conservation that spreads aerial 1080 into our native forest. Yeah, 1080 is a poison, suppose, put down, to kill the possums, the, mm. the Australian possum, not like an American possum, this possum has a furry tail, and these possums are eating the native bush. So they think, somebody thinks that it's good to drop a bunch of poison to kill these rodents. Yes. However, it turns out with 1080, which incidentally is manufactured in America, but its use is banned in America, but New Zealand imports it, hmm. and 1080 kills everything that breathes air. So it kills native life as much as it would possibly kill introduced species. Hmm. So we are very concerned. Um, there's been a, a grand American study which has shown that herbicides, pesticides, account for around 70 percent of loss of the soil biota so this is the soil biota meaning the 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 life inside the soil like the microbes and things yes, like that but it also means all the insects that pupate in the soil because moths and butterflies for instance drop their eggs mm. into the soil and 1080 is particularly disastrous for any fetal or larval stages of development mm. but this is unseen this will be a long-term effect that doesn't become visible mm -hmm. and of course i think this raises a problem encountered worldwide that only professional academic science has been given credibility 
And now there's an expression, citizen science. Citizen science. Oh, yes. I like that. That's the first time. Yes, citizen science. Why yes. not? Yes. Whereas we are, we are asserting that our observations must be given credence. Yes. Well, I mean, you're the one here observing, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And uh, you're, uh, you're a doctor of what, Wendy? Well, my great love of my life is anthropology. Anthropology. Yes. Yes. Now, uh, as a as a woman going yes. off to study anthropology what 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 how old were you when you went to school for this oh uh, well i um, entered university at the age of 18 and were there lots of women doing that at that time um yes i was the only woman from my secondary college mm -hmm. who went to university mm -hmm. but there were plenty of female students however that wasn't altogether my problem. My problem was with the people lecturing in anthropology because just at that point, anthropology had decided to declare itself a science. And I was studying the languages and literature as well as anthropology. And I saw anthropology as a creative art. And this was my great argument with the mm. lecturers. Yeah. For instance, um, the African anthropologist from Britain were asking the question, why is a woman's brother called a mother in many lineages? Mm. And they, the, the, the British anthropologists whose work was being taught to us, were trying to work out this question theoretically. And I sat there thinking to myself, well, why don't they ask the people yeah. <laughs> who have these practices? <laughs> anyway, it so happened that with anthropology as the love of my life, I failed stage three. And I thought, if I sit it again, I will be marked by the same people. So with another anthropologist, another student, mm -hmm. we bought a yacht and we sailed to the kingdom of Tonga to a very remote island called Niopa'o, which had been forcibly evacuated by the government after an eruption in 1946. And the people were brought back to the main island of Tongatapu and Ewa, and they were treated so badly by Tongan people that they began to make their own way back to their homeland at which point the Tonga government said, well, you will have to manage without any government services. Which they had been doing for a million years beforehand. Yes, <laughs> yes. with the mother's brother. Yes. 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 So I, I will just briefly explain that in Tongan kinship system, the mother's side have the duty of taking care of you. So it's not, it doesn't matter whether it's of the sisters or the brothers, they are all responsible for your well-being. Uh -huh. Whereas on the father's side, the father and his sister, they have authority over you. And this became really of great interest and importance to me because I wanted to answer, how did these people manage oh. without government services? And I think one of the clues is that the Polynesian and African and other kinship systems provide a system of governance because when you're born, you're given a kinship term that relates you to every person differently according to what kinship term you use in relationship to them. Mm -hmm. So if there's somebody you call your mother's brother, then you know you can always run to that person for help and they have a duty to provide for you. Mm. And so it's with the system whereby everybody recognizes their duties to each other that people be, are self-governing, as you yeah. said, as they have been for thousands of years. So now, of course, third world societies, first nations, whatever we call them, are recognizing that it's it's possible that their own systems of governance were actually better for human well-being yeah. 
than our modern systems, including our highly rated democracy, which in New Zealand has now allied itself with corporations and is no longer regarding itself as civil servants to mm. serve our communities. Right. And of course, this comes back to transition town. We want to manage ourselves. Right, because at one point, uh, like Coromandel had its own sort of little town council, and then now it's the whole peninsula, you know, you're, yes. you're governed by a body that's much further yes. away and yes. doesn't know what you're up to here. Yes, and added to that, we now have to pay also rates, not only to our district council, but to our regional council. And so we are funding a cycling velodrome in the heart of the Waikato in Cambridge, which none of us use and is of no benefit whatever to us. Mm. And we had a very good elected councillor who worked out that actually the regional council collects more in rates than it returns to our communities ah. on the peninsula. Yeah, yeah. So people in Hamilton, in the heart of the Waikato, they have a public library service with huge resources and we have only a very small library at Thames, which was a council that says it can't spend any more money. Mm -hmm. So we're paying rates for a city lifestyle that we don't have. That you don't have. No. Yes. Transition to a more community community. Yes. So that's the transition. We're tra you're transitioning sort of back to communal. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And you see, one of the joys we're finding is that people are so willing in our small community to cooperate and to stop for half an hour and lend a hand to mm. move a heavy object or, mm. or put up a fence or whatever help is needed. So we do have that pleasure of being amongst people who are self-occupied and it gives a very peaceful landscape to live in. Whereas I think people in cities, they love the hum of activity, the regularity of buses and trains, the security of an employment system where they can find work. I guess it's two different kinds of personality. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with city living, if, and but if you happen to be well, out here, you want a, you want a governance system that serves you, basically. Yes, that is managed by us and designed by us. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about city living now that Auckland has announced that its air is full of minute um, synthetic fibres. Oh yeah, well, the whole world, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And when I go to Auckland, I can smell the diesel way out in the suburbs. I can smell it. Yeah, because you have a, a clean palate. <laughs> It's not. Okay, so you went off and studied anthropology. Yes. That is so exciting. And then and then, have you always been um, involved in the natural world? Because I know you have written things about... Yes. The... Yes. Well, I suppose that's my rural background. I, um, I went to Victoria University in Wellington to do a PhD. And... That came out of a year I had spent in the Northland of New Zealand with remote Maori communities. I was recording... Maori are the local indigenous, indigenous population. People. Yes, the people who own this land. Yes. <laughs> so, and, and very, very much neglected by government. Yes. So, I, during my years in anthropology, I had realised that Western science had become very arrogant and governments had accepted a stance whereby the findings of Western science were considered as putting aside the knowledge systems of the indigenous people. Right. That superiority was being granted to Western science. So I went to Northland with a diesel van and $5,000 from the New Zealand Lottery Board. And my objective was... Now, what year was this? In the 1980s. In the 1980s, okay. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. My objective was to record the Maori names of insects because oh. I had worked out that 
with a bird that's one Maori name to one English name or one scientific name. Whereas with insects, where we've got 20,000 or so or more species, every Maori name will group a number of insects under the one name. And that then I would be able to see how they were being classified and I would be able to describe a classification system. Mm -hmm. And then we could say to the New Zealand scientists and the New Zealand Education Board that Maori classification is its own scientific system. Right. They didn't just, <laughs> yeah, they have their own systems of, but, yes. well, they're the greatest navigators in the world. And well, it, yes, Andrew Crow. The path of the birds. Yes, that's a, a wonderful assembly of Pacific knowledge. Yeah. Extraordinary piece of work. Um, it's really an encyclopedia in itself because Andrew Crow also is an ecologist and he's written many books on New Zealand native insects and plants and so on, shellfish, wildflowers. I know we have this idea that uh, uh, should we call them primitive peoples? I don't know. Ancient tribes or whatever that they were, you know, primitive and didn't know anything and sort of running around half naked, covered in mud. But in fact, they had uh, very advanced navigational skills. They have a whole medical thing. They have classifications for every animal and bird. And, and, and in fact, I think that this idea that that native peoples are somehow not as smart as us Western scientists, hopefully that's an outdated thought. Yes, it's taking a long time for governments to alter their practices and thinking right. towards that. But you see, as I was describing with the kinship system, I think these earlier cultures have been geniuses at social relations. Right. And we are losing a good quality of social relationships in our competitive society. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yep. Yeah. And it's interesting because this idea of globalization, on the one hand, it's sort of appealing. Like, you know, you get, if you have a, if you have 10 stores, you can buy more at less and then we all get it cheaper or something. But there's quite a bit lost by putting everybody in the same big pot because we're not all in the same pot. No, um, I think in our transition town, in our community network, we will put a lot more emphasis on enabling people to realize their talents. Mm. Whereas our present system of education is directed very much towards training people in a particular body of knowledge to have particular skills. It means government can manage us as a mass community providing work and labor. Yeah. Whereas in our transition town, we want to provide the work and labor for each other. Yeah, that is great. Um, and so if people around here in Coromandel that happen to see this, if they want to get involved in your tr transition town movement, yes. how would they find out about it? They would look for the Coromandel Community Network. Coromandel Community, Community Network. Network and they can find that yes. and and you all and and they can join with you if they if they feel the same way you do which is wonderful. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. but I do want to go back to what happened with my work yes. on Maori classification yes. of insects. I, I went to Wellington which is New Zealand political centre and I went to Wiramu Ka who was the director of education and told him about this work and dear Wurumukar said to me, Wendy, it would take an act of parliament to get this into the New Zealand educational curriculum. Yes. This is the 1980s. So very slowly, we are moving towards an assertion of the right of Maori knowledge to be given equal status. Right. Right, and I guess, and then, and then there'll be some people opposed to that. But. Oh, and there are scientists strongly opposed. Yeah, right. Um, the question has arisen over whether Mataoronga Māori can be called science or not.
But if we look at science as a system of systematic observation, then the Maori body of knowledge has had 3,000 years in the Pacific. Yeah, of systematic yeah. Observation. observation. Yes. 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 Yeah, they don't just come up with random names for things or ideas. They have a real reason yes. why they call something something or use something. And this is a wonderful aspect of Andrew Crow's book, is the way that he has looked at the naming of things, of plants and animals and birds in the Pacific Islands, the tropical Pacific Islands, and what happened to those names when they were transferred to our temperate climate in New Zealand. It, it's, it's very wonderful. I think an example is mica, which is an edible banana in tropical Pacific Islands. But here it's the bulb of a, um, an orchid, an edible bulb of an orchid. Ah, so it's a different plant going by the same name that serves sort of the same function, like you can eat it. Yes. Yes, yeah, so they found... Yes. Yes, so Mataronga Māori is... What is this word, Mataronga? Well, it's a knowledge system. A knowledge system, okay. Yes, yeah. yes. It's, um, it seemed to me when I was working on classification of insects that you have to have a very fine observation of ecology to appreciate the meaning of the names. Mm. So the names are clues very often to how a group of insects behave. Mm, yeah. Yes, and I found it works very well. I learned Maori names of insects far more quickly than I had learned New Zealand names mm. of insects. For instance, with the um, with the click beetle in Maori, it's called tu panapana. Pana. Tu is to be upright, and panapana pana is the flapping sound. As the, as the click beetle clicks its thorax, it shoots its body up into the air and it lands pata pata on the floor. Right. So you see, you hear the name, children hear the name Tupana Pana, and then they hear the sound, and then they can connect right. the insect with the name. Yeah, and it's easier to hold on to it, because like we all know, if you can connect a word to a, yes. something else, then it... Hmm. Yes. Whereas you see in this highly vaunted system of Western science, the Latin names for insects are very often after a so-called discoverer, scientific discoverer or, or naming, namer of yeah, this, right. this group of insects. So the scientific name gives you no clue whatever to the ecological behavior of the insect, of the mm. creature. Yeah. So actually we could say that if you want to really understand New Zealand's flora and fauna, you might best approach it through Maori naming and classification. Hmm. Yeah, that's so interesting. Absolutely. Yes. Wow. Mm. So other than, um, okay, so other than going off, getting your own little boat and going off and doing your own thing, you, the, to me that sounds very brave as a, as a woman back in the 80s by yourself going off. Why are you so brave? Well, of course, that's my farming background. Oh. But that reminds me, this is, this is the book that we wrote, the other anthropologist, Garth Rogers and I, as a result of three months on UFO. So we went there with all these ideas of structural anthropology that we had to describe the politics and the kinship and the economy and the gardening and the fishing and so on. But what people really wanted to talk about was their experiences of the evacuation and of their return to the island. So that's what we produced. Yeah. This so you book. went with an idea of what you wanted to write. Yes. And then instead of making the information fit that, you went there and you started gathering information yes. and then you wrote what was really yes. needed or wanted in that yes. area. And I must tell you about the anthropologist I worked with, Garth Rogers. He was um, an English working class boy. He migrated to Australia at the age of 14 and worked as an agricultural labourer. And then he came to New Zealand with a sheep shearing gang. And he learned from one of the shearers that in New Zealand, this would have been 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, 
In New Zealand at that time, any person over the age of 21 could be admitted to university without any qualifications. Oh. So this, this agricultural labourer went to Otago University and studied history and archaeology. And then he came to Auckland University where he studied social anthropology. And after his return from fieldwork in Tonga, he was appointed first as a tutor and then as a lecturer in anthropology. Yeah, so he had no sort of previous uh, e uh, education to no, no. You could just present and yourself at the age of 21 wanting knowledge. Yes, and he was a wonderfully successful anthropologist on Nyopo. He wasn't a good linguist and he would join the evening carver circles and he so, would wait, wait, the evening carver circles. So this is in in the islands. Yes. And carver is a drink yes. that and so they sit in a circle and sort of share a drink that's mildly euphoric or yes. something. Yeah. Yes, yes. The, it's the men. It's a circle of, of men and they discuss gardening and fishing and courting women. Mainly. And uh, what are the women doing while all the men are sitting around? Ah, <laughs> the women are lying behind the curtain. We used to lie flat on the floor on our side and we could see under the curtain. Women are not supposed to be present except for the young lady who is making the kava mm -hmm. and who is a potential fiancé for the men in the carver circle. But I used to love the way the women who were not supposed to overhear these conversations were, of course, known to be lying behind the curtain. Listening. Yeah, of course. <laughs> How interesting. Yeah. yeah. And so Garth, Garth would mime the actions of shearing and the stories of his life. And the Newfo people absolutely took him to heart. And they taught him how to ask them the questions he wanted in Tongan. It was extraordinary. Once they understood that he was making genealogical records mm. so he could understand the system of social relations, they taught him how to ask them for their family genealogies, mm. what questions to ask in Tongan. Now, that's extraordinary yeah. because most, in fact, I think all anthropologists who were teaching us in the 1960s at university level, they were all using interpreters to do their field work. Mm. Whereas we were on an island where there was barely an English speaker. So we we worked in the Nyopa'o language. Hmm. Yeah, that's super interesting and brave and yes. how fabulous. Yes. And the, some of the people I met in Tonga in the 1960s have remained forever my friends. There's an, a very great movement of Tongan people and Pacific people to the cities of Auckland, City, uh, Sydney, Melbourne, San Francisco, and so on. So my life continues amongst Tongan people. Even though I'm here on the Coromandel Peninsula, I go to Auckland and spend time discussing problems of Tongan history with my Tongan friends. Hmm. That is so interesting. And so you were born on a, on a sheep farm, is that correct? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. I was born during World War II in 1942. And one of my earliest recollections of my mother opening at the cupboard where she kept the crockery and silver that was served to guests. And she took out some black cloths and she explained to me that they were blackout curtains because there was enormous paranoia in New Zealand in during 1940s, during World War II, that the Japanese were in, to invade. So our remote farm homesteads in the middle of the North Island had to put up blackout curtains. We were, the households were a mile from each other, spotted over the countryside. We had to black out uh, all our windows at night and we had to imagine that some some lone Japanese pilot was going to come bomb your house. Yes, that he would fly around the Waikato bombing each 
farmhouse and um, when he'd expended his load of bombs, maybe if he had enough petrol left in the engine, he would <laughs> fly back to Japan. <laughs> that is funny. So why do you think that ideas like that take off? Is it because, you know, maybe that's a way I can help the war effort by blacking out my windows? Yes. I mean, why do you think that, that everyone around sort of took it on instead of saying, oh, don't be ridiculous, we're not going to do it? That's right. New Zealand was, and in some ways still is, such an obliging society towards its government. I think there's a big rebellion going on right now. And we note in the last Australian elections, a very large vote for the small parties. Mm. Anyway, certainly in the 1940s, when we were, were a welfare state, fairly socialist, um, New Zealanders were very obliging to government. Right, so the government said, and why do you think the government bothered to ask everyone to black out their curtains? I mean, well, why do you think the New Zealand government thought it was a good idea for everyone to black out the... Oh, well, it was because the government believed Japan would invade. Would come, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Anyway, that, that was my early skepticism towards government. Mm -hmm. We had... Um, a sheep and cattle farm, which my father had inherited from his father. My grandfather and my great-grandfather were chemists in Auckland, mm. but it was believed at that time that farming in the Waikato was the great romantic adventure. Oh, back to sort of like this, this movement back to the country. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes, yes. And maybe the British loved the idea of having an estate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, my grandfather and grand great grandfather bought what turned out to be a swamp filled with tea tree brush in the middle of the Waikato. And then the four sons each received a quarter of that land. And the three sisters, it was a family of seven, the three sisters received nothing mm -hmm. because my grandfather said their husbands will look after them. Mm. So that was my introduction to feminism. <laughs> I have been a strong feminist. <laughs> Good for you. Because I saw the resentment in my aunts and in their children that... Right, because their children didn't gain from any of the family wealth. No, no. And also my aunts were good country women, good farming women, and they married working men. Right. And so, so they were never wealthy. Never had anything. No. And so, um, so did you, did you, was there a woman's movement back around then? I mean. Oh, well, um, I think we owe a lot to our mothers. Uh, the wives who married into the Four Pond Brothers were um, women who were very keen themselves to enter into the adventure of farming and they worked on the farms as well as running the households and bringing up the, the children but um was it a formal woman's rights movement or just no, sort of an underground one no it it, it, mm. it was um the women's welfare league yes yeah, so there were women's groups but they were war effort groups mm. but at least women were working together mm. but i think my introduction to feminism really came during my secondary college years at Matamata College in the Waikato, where um, I was a gymnast, and at the age of 15... You were a gymnast? Yes. What was your specialty? Oh, vaulting. Vaulting? Yes. Oh, how fun. Yes. Yeah, interesting. Okay, yes. carry on. Yes. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> I, w <laughs> I went to the preset teacher at the age of 15, at the end of that year, and I said to him, the girls are better at gymnastics than the boys. And he said, yes, he said, um, the girls develop earlier and their bodies are more flexible. Anyway, so I went home for the summer holidays. I turned 16 on Christmas Eve and I spent the summer in the shearing shed, leaping over the wool bales. I'm very short. The wool bales came up to my neck and in the cramped space of a shearing shed, as the bales accumulated, I had very little run-up, and I practiced endlessly 
leaping from the floor up onto the top ah. with a leapfrog onto the bale and eventually I could leap right over the bale. Oh, so here we are, beginning of the year at Mathematical College. I turned 16 and all the school is assembled on the hot summer's day to watch a demonstration of gymnastics by the senior boys. Ooh. So I watched them. They put out a four tier vaulting box, the height of a wall bale. Ah. Stood up. And they were going to assemble all the other gear for the gymnastics. So I stood up, I took off my gym dress. I had rompers on underneath. Rompers. Yep. That's I, a funny word. Ah. Rompers or shorts or something. A, a sort of um bulbous shorts. Okay. Yes. I walked out to the middle of the playing field with this lone four-tier vault standing there. I had now to do a long fly, which is a vault of leapfrog along the length of the box. Mm. Whereas I've been practicing with wall bales yeah. that just had a short square top. Yeah. But now I had to do a leapfrog along the length oh. of the box. So I ran up to the box and sprang into the air and reached out for the end of the box. But I didn't reach the end of the box. Ah. My hands landed about three quarters of the way along. My legs were split. And now I had to get myself over the box because if I just sat down on the box, the whole school would laugh at yeah, me. Yeah, right, sure. So I tucked in my rump, my haunches, and brought in my legs underneath me and shot off with an enormous push over the end of the box and landed perfectly balanced on the sack. Well, there you go. And so, uh, and and uh, was that considered odd that you would run off the from the the you know the the sidelines? You're supposed to be watching. Yes. And you just take your clothes your your dress off and and run to the middle of the field and and vault. Yes. And that was that considered shocking, or everybody just sort of watched you do it and well, you see, silent. because I only just made it over the edge of the box, I heard this great gasp from from everybody. And as I returned to my place, the headmistress marched up to me and said, Wendy, don't you ever do that again. Oh, there you go. Forget your talents. Yes. <laughs> yes. Not, Wendy, what a stunning, remarkable achievement. Yes. In future, we will invite the girls to do a gymnastic display. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was the beginning of my feminist years. You are yeah, it's such amazing stories you have, all these brave things. Did you consider yourself brave at the time? Or I consider you very brave doing that or getting on a boat and going off and all these things. You, How no. come you're so brave? You well, see, you see, my father had only two girls and um, the farm only gave us a self-sufficient living. Mm. So he couldn't afford to pay a man to work on the farm. So my mother and my sister and I, we were the farm labour. Yeah. And whatever our father asked us to do, we did it. So it was never a thought of being brave. It was a thought of, this is an action it is necessary to make. Yep. Hmm. How interesting. As our time is coming closer and closer to an end here, Wendy, is there um, something else you'd like, some other subject we'd like to broach? Well, perhaps I would tell you a little bit about the years of feminism. Yes, please do. Yes. So at the age of 18, I went to Auckland and did a degree in languages and literature and anthropology. And then I became an anthropologist. And then in the 70s, I went to Australia where there was already a very strong feminist movement developing in Adelaide. Hmm. And we, we would have evenings of watching films made by women, evenings of concerts of music composed and sung and played by women. Hmm. And 
those were very wonderful years. I worked for a bookshop where I produced the newsletter and I wrote reviews of all the feminist books that were coming out. Mm. So that acquainted me very well with the literature. And then I came back to Auckland and lived in houses of women where the feminist movement now, we're moving towards the late 70s, early 80s, the feminist movement was developing. And so we were separatist feminists living without men. Mm. We were living in households of women. And it happened that a group of solo mothers with children had bought two houses side by side where they were bringing up their children without men. And when the children went to school and became seven and eight, they started saying to their mothers, we want our fathers. Hmm. So that was a dilemma really within the mm -hmm. feminist separatist movement. Yeah is that the children wanted their fathers. Yeah, well. Yeah. But meanwhile, we had had very wonderful years of l becoming self-reliant. I think this was one of the major achievements of the feminist movement for women, mm. is that we, a, a group of women I was with, we bought a truck and we moved furniture. <laughs> All the mechanics done by women, changed the tires by women, loaded the furniture, unloaded the furniture. I know that's an unlikely job for, I mean, because you think of, of men as being strong yes. moving types. Well, you see, moving heavy objects is very much a matter of technique. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. you're right. Yes. Yeah. Amazing what can be done. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. So, fulcrums and all that. Yeah. A fulcrum. Yes, yes. 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 So the wonderful thing about the feminist movement was it taught women self-reliance. Mm. We learned that we could provide for our needs by our own efforts. And did you did you find that people were antagonistic towards you? Did they call you names or tell you you oh, were enormous ugly? Enormous antagonism towards the feminist movement. Yeah, yeah. Enormous antagonism. But it didn't matter because we had such a strong network amongst ourselves. Mm. And in the household, you would hear women talking endlessly about how they were emotionally responding to something that had been said mm. or household arrangements. We, we developed a rule that the first woman leaving the house in the morning had to do the housework and the dishes because we were finding that women would rush off to work ah. and leave a solo mother or somebody working at home to do the dishes sure. and, the, and the shopping and so on. Yeah. So that was the rule. First person leaving the house does the dishes. Ah, that's an interesting rule. Yes. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, yes. rather than going, oh, I'm I'm off early. I can't possibly do the dishes. Yes. Oh, yes. that's interesting. So then, uh, yeah, <laughs> I love that. Oh my goodness, our hour is just slipped by. I would love to offer you. This is uh, this is women's work right here. This is all my original Excellent. music recorded, and I I really thank, thank you for you. your time and energy to have joined me here to speak, and we could probably speak for the next three days. I but think we could. I'm going to take <laughs> this from you. And thank you that I will cherish this to remember our conversation. Yes. Thank and, you. Um, thank you so much, Wendy. I'm going to, um, to do a little finishing song before we end. Right. All, All the right. best. Yay. Um, this is, uh, this is a song that I like to end with, and it's called Carry My Rain in a Bushel Basket. Uh, and a bushel basket is, uh, I don't know if you have them here, but they're, you know, baskets with holes in them that you carry bushels of corn in. Um, I don't jump freight trains when they roll by. I don't get the blues, I'll tell you why. I go downtown if I want to smoke and I'm treating life like a joke. But I won't go sinning in my neighbor's yard because he's been working mighty hard. But I go downtown and I don't wear shoes. Oh Lord, I don't even sing the blues. Carry my rain in a bushel basket and carry the sunshine too. I carry my rain in a bushel basket and let the sunshine through. Carry my Basket, carry my rain in a bushel basket. Carry my rain in a bushel 
basket but let the sun shine through and I won't get cross if you smile at me and I'll throw my troubles out to sea I don't wear black I need a heart attack cause we could be happy how about that I don't think much about what could go wrong and I don't want to sing about it in a song but I'll look at you and shake my head cause Lord knows some of them people would be better off dead carry my rain in a bushel basket and carry the sunshine too carry my rain in a bushel basket and let the sunshine through carry my rain in a bushel basket carry my rain in a bushel basket carry my rain in a bushel basket and let the sunshine through I don't see Saturn when I look at the stars, but I know it's out there and so is Mars. I don't think much about the evening news, and you know I don't want to cry the blues. I don't like ham, but I do like toast, and I certainly don't care who you hate the most. And I don't care how it's always been done, because you could give in but still have a little some. Carry my rain in a bushel basket and carry the sunshine too. Carry my rain in a bushel basket and let the sunshine through. Carry my rain in a bushel basket. Carry my rain in a bushel basket. Carry my rain in a bushel basket and let the sunshine through. You gotta let your sunshine through. All right, everybody. Don't keep your light under a bushel. Let it all shine through. The next show will be in a couple of weeks from I don't know where because I'm traveling. And I thank you all. This show is over. And I'm so glad we were here. Goodbye. <laughs>